welcome to NSS Connections. My name is Gwen Peer, and I'm here in the NSS offices. We're expecting over 100 people and um, friends, members, colleagues tonight, so please remain muted so as not to distract our speaker. You mm -hmm. may enter questions in the chat room. We will try to answer everyone a little later in the program. Um, Thanks in advance to Tracy and Sabin Howard for inviting us into their studio this evening. I know some of you have been following the progress on Sabin's current project. Um, for those of you who are less familiar, a little background, um, early in 2016, the World War I Memorial Commission selected architect Joe Weishauer and sculptor Sabin Howard's design, The Weight of Sacrifice, for the National World War I Memorial, which will ultimately be sited in Pershing Square in Washington, DC. This work honors the men and women who served and gave their lives in the Great War, ranked as one of the deadliest conflicts in human history. Sabin started work on the principal structure in August of 2019. Sabin and Tracy are documenting the process of creating this memorial with a series of short films that you can view at sabinhoward.com. And we're gonna share one of those with you, but first we're going to jump to the studio because um, I would love for you to meet their entire team. And uh, it's the end of the day and some of them will be leaving soon. So, um, Tracy and Sabin, if you could please unmute the camera and I will spotlight you. Okay, go. Hey, hello. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Gwen, for the introduction. And uh, I'm here with Tracy in Englewood, New Jersey, and my crew is assembled here. Hello. Hello. They are ready for execution. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is Charlie Mostow. He's a sculptor. And Christian Nos Nossel. Ashdale. Oh, Ashdale. He's very famous now. <laughs> so he's changed his name. Okay. And um, then we'll start with the models. I'll just go across the board. And we have Dante. Nice to meet you. And uh, Paul Sendron, who is also our videographer, and Mark Paczynski, and Madeline Howard, who um, is my daughter, and you can introduce yourself as? Um, I'm Giuliano, and I'm Tracy's assistant. Yes. <laughs> and I would just like to say a quick shout out to sculptor Daniel Barup and his class at Shelley High School in Sh uh, Shelley, Idaho, for um, bringing the whole class to uh, this webinar, as well as Admiral Cohn and his wife, Nancy, who is a sculptor. So um, thank you very much. Um, and the Silverboard. And the Silver, Jer Jerry Silverboard, as well as, well as Nancy. Um, and that is our crew. Um, what else can I tell you? As a sculptor on a project of this magnitude, you can't do it by yourself. So you need to create a culture and a community that will have the same vision and support the energy and creative aspect of it that is a unified front. And so these guys act with me as one unit because we're making one sculpture with many figures in it. So guys, go home, time for time. <laughs> Thank you. Good night guys. Good night. Good night. All right, there you have it. And then Tracy and I will just take it from here. And we hear Gwen again. Yes, thank you, Sabin. You know, we're going to share one of the wonderful videos on the SabinHoward.com website. As okay. Sort of, I, you've been working for years on this, and this will, that'll be a good four minute catch up. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Hold on, let me mute. Yeah. All right, today is September 28th, 2020. We're into the battle scene the first week, and I'm going to share with you an email that I got last night because I think it, it's important that you guys know that the sculpture has very deep significance and who we're doing it for. 
this is one letter and I get a lot of them but I thought this was really like impactful and shows we're on the right track all of you everyone here I'm very grateful that you're all in it with me dear sir as a vet I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you and your wife have done to memorialize our World War I vets in a manner reminiscent of the Greek and Roman traditions. I personally can't wait to see the memorial in person. I can only hope that any memorials erected honoring the conflicts I served in are rendered with the same thoughtfulness, passion, devotion, and professionalism you put into your National World War I Memorial. Thank you again, respectfully yours, Vincent Stella. When you get a letter like that to have the emotional impact already starting to like trickle in, it's definitely meaningful, you know, it adds like a whole nother layer to my experience here. Cause for me, it kind of helps zoom out a little bit, I guess, and remember the power of the actual art that we're making. Let's do your hours. It's the week, it's the 30th week of sculpting. We've got about 20 more. Number two, kneeling dad. Charlie worked on him this week. He's got 450 hours. I think he's probably got another 100 hours you'll have to do on him. I have to have X amount of hours on each one and it's nowhere near what I would like. So you better be executing and proceeding with maximum effort and full focus every single time you show up. Because you know all planes that face the same direction with a single source of light are of equal value. Plates or the planes are like boom, boom. Oh, it, and they're hits of light. Yeah, I gotta make some coffee. That's how this studio works. Is when we wake up, we get here, it's coffee, coffee, coffee. Come over here. See this? These uniforms are from the war. These are a standard issue World War I uniforms. Do you see, it? you see this? This is completely just like blown out from like dynamic posing. So, you know, you're in a lunge, you're in a crouch or something, and you just wanna, basically your muscles are just busting through and then this happens. Feels like, uh, like that feeling you get when your leg almost falls asleep, that's kind of what's happening. So we do like shorter, shorter bursts. Just the lean is super low. We, no, we have to just, we have to build a separate thing for the elbow here in this position. Yeah. You just do that. Yeah, put a little bit of weight down there as well. Yeah, and yeah. then you're doing the lunge. That's what we do. That's it. That's so much better. Um, I do want you to like really take care of yourself after work. Yeah. No, I'm going to be icing every day. Yeah. <laughs> I just got off the bus, I'm like, let me just stop in to see. Yeah. Uh, see how far y'all have gotten along. No, I was born in 63, so I'm 57 years old. Oh, you're 57? Yeah, I'm, I'm you're still, still young. young man. I'm still a young guy. <laughs> yeah. So I do like um, nine to 10 figures every year. Okay. And I got like 27 figures to go. I was what, 20, no, 19 when I went in? Yeah. That's a long time it's ago, like that man. Kid, he's 21. Memories. My picture's in, the, in mine now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right, my man. All right. I'm going back to do my thing. Do your thing, man. So Monday and we're at the end of the day. It never gets easy and there's never a moment of complacency and like, I got this. You don't got this till you actually have done it. I think the best way to, to, to start this is to give you some background on my training and then um, how this progressed into the project. So um, if we'll, we can walk to the other side of the room, um, the studio is 50 feet by 100 feet and we have skylights, um, natural light or four of them. And then I use these artificial lights that we can roll around. So let me, I wanna I want to start by showing you what I did prior to um, the memorial and my, my education was in a very classical um, structural approach that came out of the Philadelphia College of Art in the 80s. I started um, making art at age 19 and my, my idea then was there were you know three artists, Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael. I had no idea that there was this abstract expressionism or conceptual um, idea of modern art going on. And so my background is Italy, 
and New York in the 60s. My mother's Italian, I grew up in Italy. And so I thought art was what the Renaissance were. And so when I started at 19, I was very lucky to find like almost this bastion or hotbed of figurative art that was run by Walter Erlbacher and there were some other artists under him like Tony Visco and Harvey Citron. And I got a first grade education that gave me a structure to work with. So there was no um, experimentation from the very beginning. I had a methodology to proceed forward. And um, from there, I then sculpted with models, always with models, using the education of anatomy, three-dimensional anatomy, as well as two-dimensional anatomy, which was taught by Walter's wife, Martha Erlbacher. And her work was very much in the vein of Botticelli, which was all about lying. And so I still did not come, consider myself a sculptor per se, but I consider myself a draftsman. And I think of sculpture as three-dimensional drawing. It's like drawing on steroids. These sculptures were what I did when I finished the Philadelphia College of Art. Um, I went, I was in Italy in Rome, and then I, I went back for a graduate degree to New York Academy, and I had Lou Marinaro, who was a student also of Walter. And again, it was a reinforcement of this structure of the figure. So here's the thing that I think really differentiates me from a lot of the stuff that's going on out there today. Um, I am very entrenched in the ideology that uh, the structure or the um, architecture, which is a skeleton, is what is most important in how you proceed in creating something that is truly uh, about us as human beings. Because these figures are, uh, over uh, 15 to 20, 50, 18 years of work. And I worked with a model every day for, um, I guess 18 years. So it, it adds up to like over 50,000 hours of working with life models. So I entered this competition, which was a um, global competition. Let's go to the drawing. I had never done uh, public work and I had been a teacher for a while and the public work to me was, okay, this is the way that I can reach a lot of people and have some power in proceeding forward and making figures that will reach a much broader audience. But I had to change as an artist and I had to go from being a classicist to becoming much more expressive and much more of a humanist. So it, my, uh, this is the drawing that eventually passed. And I did, um, 18 different iterations of this, this image. And I worked with the Centennial Commission, specifically um, the head of that, which was Edwin Fountain. And this, I won the contest in January of 2016. And it was uh, 360 global teams and five finalists were picked. Um, Joe Weishar contacted me, he was the architect. And from there then um, we had to go through the, the next step, which was making Centennial Commission happy with what we would present to the bureaucracy, you know, the bureaucracy of Commission of Fine Arts in Washington and all the other five agencies that you have to go through when you're doing a public project on um, federally mandated land. This project had been um, signed into effect by Obama and uh, it, there, there's so much structure in something like this. So we went through relatively fast. We passed through the gate of the Commission of Fine Arts in a year and a half, which is unheard of. And in that time, this drawing was presented. It was okay. And then from that point, then I said to Edwin, we need to make a sculpture to present. And I ended up in New Zealand and with a company that does film work as a help. And in a period of relatively short time, which was from July of 2017 till January of, was it 2018, I created this relief panel and I had help with 
getting this together. And this is 10 feet long. I had help getting this together, but then I ended up having to sculpt for 71 days straight, probably 11 to 12 hours a day. And this then went back to the Commission of Fine Arts and was knocked down. And then I had to go through this whole process of getting it approved with them, with Centennial Commission backing me. So from that point, we then, at the end of 2018, had to come up with a new maquette because they, I was asked to shorten the distance. And so I, I then found another company in England that is called Pangolin Editions, and they are a big foundry in Stroud outside of London. Um, their main client is Damien Hurst. So they're very good at using um, the technical digital aspect with um, traditional foundry work and craftsmanship there and aesthetic is amazing because their owner, not their owner, but their, the man who runs that runway kingdom has um, something that I, I have not found a lot in foundries in this country, which is aesthetics of art with amazing craftsmanship. It's not just putting it together. So this model is a reduction of some of the figures in the, that you just saw in the 10 footer. And then some of the piece of figures such as the middle figure, let's zoom in on this, the hero. The, so you can see the scale of that, that's my finger on the gun. So that's photogrammetry, which is a setup of 160 cameras on a model in the middle all the, the cameras go off at the same time and you capture a three-dimensional photograph that then can be placed into a computer and the data can be printed out with a milling machine and you can um, get anything you want, any scale you want. So that's basically our process. This is the model right here that passed um, the Commission of Fine Arts and that was 2018, correct? Or 20, 2019? 2019. After, after, because we were in January 2019 in Pennsylvania. Yeah, so January 2019, uh, I, I, I think we went in and, and, and we were approved in May of 2019. So the competition starts in 2015 and it ends in 2019 in approval. The first um, year and a half is, or year, is completely dedicated almost to a little bit over a year and a half to getting the client happy. Then with a the drawing, the drawing then goes to the Commission of Fine Arts. I go through another year and a half. So that's quite a bit of time. You really got to have some chutzpah to hang in there. And what I found the most trying aspect of this was, how do you hold on to a vision? And yet at the same time, please thousands of people. So, um, I, want to, I want to interject here and I want to show something very personal. So let's, and, and let's walk to the other side of the room and I'll explain how I, because I think it's very meaningful for the artists that are here and maybe also has greater significance also for other people. I was very confused in the beginning because I was being told by 10 people in the room, 10 different things. We want this memorial to have this or this, tanks, horses, barbed wire, um, you need to include airplanes. You need to do more uh, of this aspect. It's very confusing, especially when World War I is not really front and center in your imagination. So what happened was I was in my studio in the South Bronx. And so I went into the bathroom in the South Bronx and I've moved the same poster to my bathroom. Show that. My, my restroom in my Englewood studio. And I have on, on the wall this image, The Last Judgment from the Sistine Chapel. This is what I know. This is what I am closest to in terms of what I wish to proceed forward with. This is my lineage. So I look at this and I was like, light bulb. That's 
That's what I'm supposed to do. Do what you know. Do what speaks to you. What has led you to this point in your artistic career. And that gave me the ability to proceed forward in a way that I didn't have before. It's this kind of the last judgment and Michelangelo's vision of it was to create all of humanity. We all have an expiration point and we all face our maker at the end of the day. So this means there is a unity of humanity. And in that composition, all of humanity is like a pretzel. It all fits together. It's all intertwined. Spatially, the figures on that, on that fresco advance and recede towards you, just like the anatomical training that I had. When you look at a figure, everything's like going towards you and away from you. And it's always moving on a spiral. It's the way I've, I constructed a single figure. And it's the way then that I took to the composition of a whole. I never did a composition of this magnitude. I actually really never did multiple figure compositions. I never actually sculpted drapery. I never did um, a public work. Um, Can I show them the figures? Yeah, so I think the way to go is to show you next um, what comes in here and then what we do to it. So we had delivered, let's look at this wall. Tell them there are 38 figures. Well, the wall itself is 58 and a half, half feet long. And uh, there are 38 figures. And if you stay there and I can point. I don't know if they can hear. They can, I'm loud enough. So we get this in sections and we can take it all apart. These posts are where the figures come out of and everything fits on an armature. So you, can you just ring, show that, just show a figure in the background. So we take the figures off and then we work on them separately from a life model. <clears throat> I never work from anything two dimensional. I think it's really a shame that um, people believe that digital is going to knock out the traditional artist because the digital is a translation from reality through a mechanical device. And this, your mind, the mind of an artist is far more powerful than a mechanical device such as a computer. Um, we have more than five senses. So when you have a model in front of you and you're using that as your reference, you are bringing so much more life to your art than a computer ever can. However, a project of this magnitude would be a lifetime's work. And so being able to use a digital underlying structure, that's to me just an armature is an amazing aspect of speeding up the grunt work of something of such, you know, epic proportion. And so I use these as more of an armature. I don't save the surface. I don't save the forms. I just go to town on it. I rip it apart and I do what the model is doing in front of me. Now I have a vision also. I, I know how we're supposed to do that. So let's take, take a look at one of the figures. Um, we can pull out here. Let's look at the back of this. So this is this was chopped. I chopped. You can see the foam underneath, and I'll rotate it. I'll rotate this figure out so you can see it. These, are, these, are, these armatures are then mounted on these wheels, and they'll be used for molding. Keep a more wide angle shot, I think. How's that? So they, and from that to the frontal view, a direct frontal view on all of them because these are um, the way that you'll see them. So you're not sculpting in a round per se, you're sculpting some parts to project out and around. And you can turn around and show that. So that's in process. And I've, I have ripped this down. This part is more complete. But let me just bring this 
to so you can see. I don't really the surface. I want to show you that it's really um, very additive. I don't think that sculpture with clay should be subtractive. I think it should be additive. So I'm constantly adding clay onto the surface and I leave all that and I draw, you can see the lines, the lines are the anatomy and the design of how each of those forms projects out into space. And sorry to be so didactic. I was a teacher for like a long time. It was over 15 years as a teacher. And so I draw three-dimensionally, like I mentioned before. And from there then, I start adding clay, go as close as I can. And that's my surface. It's not as finished as you would think. And I go, let's move back. From a distance though, it works fine. So this figure's in half process, the legs haven't been worked out. That's what's going on right now. So what we have in the background is the foam and it looks all right from a distance, but when you go up close to it, it's mannequin like it's flat. And some of these are enlargements from the maquettes and others are um, from the photogrammetry. This is the flag that basically gets re-sculpted and then the final scene. So maybe I sh would like to talk a little bit about the whole composition and the story. Okay. If we can go to that. And then I, if we could take some questions. I don't, maybe I will turn the lights on for that area because it's getting darker. Okay, you wanna? You walk over to there and I'll get the light. I'll meet you over there. Let's start and I'll point. So let's use the drawing and then you can look at both up and down. So the, uh, this, the composition and concept um, was developed, can you show the whole, was developed by doing the 18 iterations. But Tracy, who's a writer and a novelist, um, told me one morning at breakfast that I was actually doing um, a hero's journey. And a hero's journey is something that's understood in every single um, part of the world. Sorry, I was turning something off. You got it, Paul? Thanks. The hero's journey is, thank you, Paul, is in every single country, every single society, every single time period of, of, of this planet. And it's understood by everyone. And I think it is the story that we all know and experience in our own life. So it's, it, if, if I simplify it into like uh, three or four acts, and then we can run through this, and then I'll go into the details of it. So a soldier's journey is about a man the man is an allegory for the United States, and it's also a mythological story, which I just explained. So the first part, stay far away, and then we'll just, because we're gonna pan. The first part, and he, he's always the one in the composition who doesn't have the helmet on. So he is here saying goodbye to his daughter, and his wife is behind him. Then he's in the next scene, where his wife holds his arm back and he pulls forward, trapped. He's right in the middle between the Brotherhood of Arms and his family or his wife. That's the very middle of this initial panel. From there, then you go into the battle scene. And uh, the battle scene also, there's this trench where it traverses the ocean. So you begin the battle scene on rocky, this rocky ledge. And here's again, the dad is now leading the charge. This was also 
Um, a figure taken from the reference of Dan Daly, who was a very famous Marine who led a charge at Bella Woods. So that figure now appears, this is the very center of the 58 feet. That figure then, after the cost of war, the next series is the cost of war, reappears. And he has a shell-shocked look, he has thousand yards there. He has gone through the battle and he is now transformed. So you got, you, let's, let's, let me explain a little bit, going close on that, on the shell-shocked father. So it's a father who's been shell-shocked in battle, who left home, traveled through a battle or a huge adventure. And it is also somebody has, who is no longer who he was. And that's uh, also an allegory and representation of what happened to the world because of World War I. It's like a transformation of a whole planet on a cultural societal level. There's no longer a divine order. Everything now moves into alienation and chaos. Okay, so then after that figure, we move into this beginning of a parade scene home. The flag is the highest spot in the whole composition. And then the final scene is the father and he's handing his daughter, who is the next generation, the helmet. And she's looking into the helmet and dividing the future, which is what? World War II. So the key for me was like, I grew up in the Vietnam era and I had a really hard time with watching TV every night at the dinner tables. My parents like watch the news. They're both PhDs and news junkies. And I remember scenes like the little girl who had been napalmed running naked on towards, you know, the, the cameraman in Vietnam. It was on the front page of the New York Times. That had a shocking effect on me as a five-year-old. That's what I remember of war. And war was also my grandfather who was Italian who had been um, enlisted by the Mussolini and the fascists and then had ended up in North Africa and as a POW, he got captured by the Brits and then he escaped from them and traversed the Sahara Desert and then um, traversed from Africa to uh, near the Straits of Messina, which is where the boot meets Sicily, he, uh, near Reggio Calabria, and then walked from Reggio Calabria all the way to Torino, which is the full length of Italy. And that was his hero's journey. And I, I in my um, own life, because art and life are always similar, have also had to go through a similar journey where, and this, this project was like a hero's journey in some ways where you have to go through this trial by fire. Going through Washington, the Commission of Fine Arts, the Centennial Commission was a trial. Um, I was not really ready and the project needed a sculptor who would be ready to do something with such magnitude. And so I had to rise to the occasion. That's what this sculpture is about. And that's kind of like the way that I had to lead, lead my life through this, like um, this, this epic thing. So I've been on this for a while. I'm not gonna finish this till 23 or 24. Total time is almost eight to nine years. Um, and so I, I think it, personally, I always wanted to make art that had the same power is the Renaissance, and I didn't see it out there. I saw a lot of crap art, art and it, it, it really had nothing to do with like representing us as human beings. So I was not at all like thrilled with seeing art in art school when I went. That was just about the book that the art was about, or irony about the human condition. And I wanted to make something that spoke more about the heroic nature of, of, of human beings. So my, my project and Centennial Commission came together almost like a meshing. It's a way of representing war and it's not a glorification of war, but it's more about the actual um, fullness of humanity. So in this relief and the story, 
You have every single possible emotion that we, as a, you know, a species experience. There's nobility in the initial scene. There's sadness in the wife as she says goodbye. There's determination as the father goes forward. There's this animal fierceness in the battle scene as the, the father and the men rage forward. And they're all different kinetic energies here at work. There's also not a single figure that is the same as the rest. They're all different races. I'm doing uh, Caucasians. I am doing African-Americans. I'm doing Asians. I'm doing Latinos. I am also um, doing a, a Native American, Cherokee Indian. Uh, and there's a sense here that this is all encompassing of who we are as human beings. And that's where I got from The Last Judgment. Also, there are seven women in the project. Um, there are children as well. And there is a complexity to how the figures fit together. They are not isolated incidences. They are all interrelated like we are as a race. So my message in this relief and I don't know if people will see it, but it is clearly there, is that uh, the separation of us in tribalism is not the way to go. We are one race. And if you were to x-ray a, a, a black man and a Caucasian man, you would not know from the bones the difference between those two species. So that's what I, I really applied to this. And one of the other aspects that I did is how do you deal with the fact that you might have this rage here and then six feet forward, you have this sense of sacred um, tenderness in the, the pain that, is, that you have when your comrade dies. So this is a very tricky thing to do when the Commission of Fine Arts is telling you, well, make it smaller, make it shorter, jam all these elements together. So this was the trickiest aspect of the composition that I learned a lot in the um, process of 18 iteration for Centennial Commission. So I would do a, a iteration and then I would go back and do another one. And so let's look at the drawing because I think it's easier to scan. Do you have a sense from um, the middle that there's a center. And then if we go right and left, there's a very um, balanced classical aspect to the whole composition. But in that kind of balance from the center and the, spa the spatial e equality between the sections, you're not really aware of it, but this is the symmetry on the left side and the right side and that symmetry is something that you take away when you see the whole, because it works from a distance of 175 feet. And at the same time, it'll work from six feet away because you will be able to see individual unique people. And that's the thing that I always was struck by in um, Renaissance art, that let's take the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. Each figure there is a psychological detailed aspect of a, of a specific human being. And so the body for me had always been very, very complex, but um, meeting Tracy and then moving forward into a project like this, I really began to experience the whole idea of it. The way a body moves and the morphology is a visual history of who that person is and what they have passed through to become that person at that moment. And that's a very complex thing. And that's what I brought to the project. Should I take questions? Say that. Should you, take, up, please? Should you take questions? Yeah, uh, Gwen, do you want me to take questions? Uh, um, it's up to you, Sabin. I have, oh. I've got your spotlighted, but I can. we do have some in the chat room and I can read them to you. 
I, yeah, I how far in are we? We're about half an hour in. Oh, we're we're moving on to forty-five minutes. Okay, fine. Yeah, so why don't we take some questions? Okay, the first question was from Charlotte, asking, "Did the model become more three-dimensional when you went from New Zealand to Pangolin?" Um, the model, the Marquette, um, had to be compressed. It didn't become more three-dimensional, it became more compressed. The spacing had to be uh, compressed. So then the groupings became more um, unified and the empty spaces had to become really specific. So you, because you, you have chapters in the story, um, jamming it all together, doesn't work because then you don't have this pause action, pause action thing that's going on. So uh, the three dimensionality did not change. However, the action changed, the energy changed. And doing the second model, I also redid the ground and made the ground a lot more like activated um, by, I had to sculpt the ground on the five foot maquette um, one afternoon in Pangolin just with fresh hot clay. It's very spontaneous. So this is something that's kind of like cool for me. Um, I was a, a rock climber. And so I experienced a lot of pressure in situations that could be deadly. And I learned, I, I mean, I'm making an, I kind of like work really well under pressure. So it's almost as if you have a gun pointed to your head, you better perform right now. And I give my best work when I'm under that kind of pressure. And that's what happened with this project. I kind of had to like pull out all the stops when things get really like rough. Okay, fix this by next Monday. It's kind of, I just kind of pop it off. It's, and it's the same with the sculpture. So the three dimensionality actually happens more with the, the life size. I really get going on the clay and I, we're designing on the fly. I'm, I have the confidence to like go for it and move fingers, hands, gestures, heads, not a lot, but enough that it becomes way more human. And that's where the three-dimensionality occurs when I'm going up in scale to these figures that are like six foot six. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. That, the next question is from Manuelita Brown. Were you compensated during the time between becoming a finalist and approve, approval for the project? Very different type of question. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I always made art and to make art requires funds and financing. So you can't go to the studio and you can't pay for the model and you can't put money on the table for your family unless you are making art. I seem to have a lot of fear, but I also have a lot of courage and the courage always was like, you better like, go for it. And I kind of always made whatever I wanted. And even this project in some ways, I kind of stuck to my guns um, because I think being truthful to your vision is very important. Um, I think I'm very lucky that the work that I do is understood by a lot of people. And I don't want to sound arrogant, but I, I've said this before lately, you would not go see a JV basketball game and pay good money for it. But you would go see Michael Jordan play, wouldn't you? And pay good money for it. So you're going to go see somebody who's excellent and you're going to compensate them. That person better know how to say, hey, I'm worth this much. So yes, I did get compensated. I got compensated enough that I could cover my family and continue in this art process. But, and I want to underline the but, it would not have happened, the compensation would not have happened if I had not been a hard ass and said, hey, I'm not doing this unless you pay me because I can't do it. So call me when you're ready. And that's, that's something that a lot of artists have a hard time doing. They have a hard time saying, I need to be compensated for my skills and my education. I mean, you wouldn't have a plumber come over to your house and say, hey, uh, can you fix my sink and then not pay him? 
what's the difference here? And this is a really interesting thing that you've asked me, is art valuable in our culture? And that's a problem because art has really taken a low level of importance culturally in, in the world and also in the United States. So it is not valued. And that's partially the fault of the artist because they haven't made something that is universally understood and acceptable by others than themselves. Making art is not a solitary thing. You do it alone, but you serve the community with your art. So you need to think about how can I do something that has value for others and not just myself. And that has to enter into the game sooner rather than later. So yeah, I did get compensated. Thank you. Then the, ne the next question is from Brian Rieger. Have you grown closer and more connected with the subject matter being World War I over the course of the project? Um, this it might be shocking. I didn't read a single book on World War I. I did, did very little research on World War I. I read uh, enough that I knew that it was a horrific war with 40 million people dying. And then I have a friend in New York City who posed for me, who one day in the modeling studio said, I wanna tell you a story. And uh, James is um, a contractor who uh, makes millions of dollars a year. And I said, well, why do you wanna model for me? And he came in and kept modeling. I was like, why do you wanna model, James? And he said, all right, I'll tell you later at the end of the session. He said that, he um, had two family members that were in World War I. Uh, his grandfather died, great-grandfather died in World War I. Then his great uncle came back from World War I. His great uncle then proceeded to shoot his wife, shoot his daughter, and shoot himself. Sorry. That's what this stuff is about. This is emotional. This is about human beings. The problem with war memorials today is they forget that. They get too involved in the actual didactic aspect of telling what a war was. What are the weapons? How do the soldiers dress? You need to show what the soldiers look like. They look like human beings. I started the project by going to Google and looking at images. I quickly realized that those images were human beings just like us today, except they lived a hundred years ago. They suffered horrible, horrible things. You can't even imagine. It makes 9-11 and coronavirus like child's play. It's ridiculous when you start to look at the numbers of people that are dying from coronavirus compared to what happened in World War I. You have a real tragedy. This is something that we have not experienced for a long, long time. That's what this memorial is about. This memorial is about us as human beings. They do have history appropriate rifles, uniforms. The faces that I pick look like the soldiers back then, but wars are the same no matter where they are fought or what time in the history of mankind they were fought. This is serious stuff. It's not about glorifying Washington, nor the United States, nor World War I. It's about healing. It's about dealing with the aspect that we are a unified race and that we all are connected. And that's why I've made the first figure and the last figure a daughter, a young girl, because that's who's affected the most, the next generation. I hope that answers it. I'm sorry to be so emotional, but this is a really important project. Thank you, Saban. And here, I'm gonna throw an easy one at you now. <laughs> That's okay, it's all right. Um, from Jim Johnson, are you using water or oil clay? Um, <laughs> thanks Jim. <laughs> <coughs> I use, um, I use uh, Chavant NSP medium uh, and I heat it up in a toaster oven uh, and we go to work cooking our sculptures. I use, I, I heat it up because then I can really like apply it like um, terracotta. So it's very fluid and not stiff and has a sense of like spontaneity on, uh, uh, on the construction. Thanks Gwen. 
Thanks. And here's one from Heidi Wastwit. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell more about managing all those requests for tanks and planes, et cetera, to stay true to your vision? Where Were there changes you did make based on those comments besides shortening of length? Once, okay, hi, Heidi. Uh, once, <laughs> how do I say this without insulting? I, I'm, very stubborn, <laughs> but I'm also polite. And so once the drawing had passed through the Centennial Commission, um, I put my foot down and I was like, I'm not changing the composition. This is like as good as you're going to get. And I stood in front of the Commission of Fine Arts and my client, Centennial Commission said, this is what we got. I'm not going to start trying to change things because we're just going to go downhill from this place. And I felt so strongly that what I had done was the best that I could do that I just said, this is what we have. So let's proceed. And I don't want to get into the details, but it's not a pleasant thing to put an artist in when they get the largest project of their life. And there's this power play to like, okay, why well, you need to change this, you need to change that. And some of the things that I was told in this process, for example, I, we have a wall that has the figures on the front and on the back there is a water fountain. In one of the Commission of Fine Arts meetings, that was, it was suggested because we were going up against a lot of different juggling balls here that we turn around the sculpture and the sculpture would face the back and the fountain would face the, the viewer. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? There is an absurdity to creating art, which is not a democratic process when you bring it to a committee and making art by committee is a sure fire way to make a camel out of a horse. It's dangerous and destructive. And in my heart, I knew that was the only way to go. So I just like said, no, we're not moving. Thank you. So I have a whole bunch of really complimentary comments here, but I'll just send you a transcript of those afterwards. Um, okay. One more question from Charlotte. Is the end product of the 3D photograph process at Pangolin, foam armatures or the foam armatures with a layer of clay? How do you receive them? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Are they foam armatures or foam armatures with a layer of clay? The, the final, the final, the would I get into the studio? From Pangolin, when you receive them. Oh, I get the foam with four millimeters of clay on it, but it's kind of like, it doesn't matter if there's clay or not on it, because I really chopped that to shreds. Do you want to go close to one of the ones? Yeah, do you want to see that? We can walk up to one. Um, let's walk over here so you can see. So you can see, here's the foam. And then there's like a skin of clay on it. And then the attachment in the back is the nuts and bolts of what we're doing. Thank you. Sure. And, and have another inquiry from Mar Marty Reese in Washington. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, go ahead. Uh, how do you find ways to decompress from sculpting a work of emotional magnitude go down there and, show them. Uh -huh. and significance uh -huh. that takes a long time to make? Oh, yeah, let me show you. I'll walk over to what one of the things that helps me out a lot. So, uh, this, this thing here is my decompression chamber. So I ride about 100, 120 miles a week. I ride to and from work from, you know, my home to the studio. And I do that in the morning to get to the studio and in the evening to get home. And that is my way of decompressing. So I also want to say, Marty, that's a really good question. Um, I 
find that there is a very strong body-mind connection. And if you don't deal with your body, your mind starts to just fall apart. And uh, I ride pretty hard and I elevate my, my breathing and my heart rate are pretty much, they're up there. Um, the winters are hard on the East Coast, so I use a Peloton machine. And um, the other aspect is I have a really loving wife and a daughter. That's key. And on the weekends, I am in a forest. I stop Friday and I begin again Monday. So it's a marathon. And um, I also have a really good crew. I've gotten rid of all the bad apples and I have a very tight, tightly knit organization with a singular um, goal and vision. And we have a sense that uh, we are doing something of great importance and we're all on the same page. Um, there's great positivity in the people that we work with. And uh, honestly, if you're doing something this big, it wasn't like overnight. It's kind of like this thing that you had to like walk up this ladder and take all these steps to get here. It's incremental. It's like when you have a child, it's the same thing. You don't go from a newborn to uh, a teenager. You've got all these steps in between. And let me tell you, my teenager is a, is a handful. And this project is equally a handful. But, it, you know, you just have to, I don't think so much about like the end product. I think a lot about staying in process and Apart from staying in process, if you are in process, you don't have time to think about like, well, how is it going to look at the end of the day? And that also my surface on my clay is about the process. It's not about like some finished, smooth, final thing. I don't finish these things. It's like I have to get off them at like 55%. And that's that's kind of like the ball game here. It's, it's, it, I hate, it's not good enough. It's the best that I can do but it still has a lot of life in it, leaving it at 50%. Six o'clock. Well, Stephen, I feel like we have to come back in a, in a year and see see where you are, you're at. <laughs> okay. It, it's been, I'm, I'm going to wrap up by reading just a few comments people have posted um, from Kirsten Bravo in every possible way, that was so inspirational. Thank you. From Jason, very good answers about creating historical ideas with sculpture. Um, from Kaya, wonderful description of the work, not only of its artistic value, but also its psychological and emotional stress that soldiers went through, bravo. Thank you, thank you. From Douglas White, um, outstanding and inspiring presentation, thank you. And from Gwen Marcus, congratulations, Stephen, just amazing. Uh, from thank Charlotte, you. thank you for sharing with all of us. And from Heidi, thank you for your openness and excellent answers to all the questions. Uh, from Jason, thank you so much. Thank you, Gwen. Enable enabling this online presentation um, and then I missed one from, oh yeah, from Daniel Borup. Thank you, Sabin and NSS. My students and I loved the tour from Mr. Mr. Daniel Borup and Shelley High School Sculpture class. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, the, the whole class watched, which is just great. And I'm sure yeah. they're feeling much more inspired. And I want to add our thanks to that, to everyone for, coming to this, joining the sculpture studio visit, and especially to you, Sabin and Tracy and your team. You just amazing, you. so generous Thank with you. your time. And um, I encourage everyone to visit sabinhoward.com because they really have produced some amazing videos of the process over the past couple of years and some also spectacular photography. Um, I believe one of your models is a filmmaker, is that correct? Yeah, Paul is right here. Oh, Paul, there he is. <laughs> I've been caught, yes. Hi. Hi <laughs> With the period <laughs> mustache. <laughs> yes, period, period, correct. Well, let me say something about that. You know, it's like, I'm really open about my creative process. And, and one of the things is, 
I really want to make a difference and bring figurative art back. And if I can show an intimate view on how this memorial was made, it can make the memorial way more interesting and educate people on a level that they're not gonna understand if they just go look at a, a, a cool looking 58 foot bronze wall. So if we show a real personal story that Paul's help and Tracy are helping me put together, it makes a world of difference in then explaining this on a global level. And I feel very strongly that I'm not making art for myself, I'm making art to serve and serve a large, large audience. Because people go to Washington, they go there to see the history of this country. And so there's gonna be veterans that have lost, you know, people in their family, uh, fathers, you know, sons. It's, it's, it's kind of like still rolling forward. This has not ended. And so I feel very, I've created something that puts me in a prison, but it's a prison of my own making and my own choice. And so this, you always are caught in the dilemma of like being in, you know, inside some sort of prison. This is, it's better to create your own prison and so in my own prison, I am able then to serve others. And so that's what I get back. It's really important. Community is incredibly important for artists. And I think this whole idea and notion about the starving art artist in the garret alone, like Van Gogh perhaps, is not so ideal. So why don't I help try to create a vision of an artist that's actually successful and interconnected with society? I think that's a way better way to go. So that's also something I wanted to mention. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. It's really, truly inspiring. Thank you, Gwen. And well, let's see what happens now in 2024 when we unveil this. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll have to come back and visit you on screen. Okay. Before September, when we finish the battle scene, how's that? Okay. Thank you. Look okay, forward Gwen. to it. In All the right, meantime, good. In the meantime, um, many thanks to everyone and stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you everybody for attending. Bye-bye.